that it was happening until I looked at Katie and then she looked at me and I was like, you have dirt on your face. And she's like, you have dirt on your face. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and it was actually like coming up it's from like dirty Don. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yes. I got to know who will be the, the last man standing <laughs> next year. Royal Rumble. Oh boy. I'll go first. Okay. You go first. I was going to be Derek, Dominic, and <laughs> Finn. Like, it, it, is there crashes? John Force is the name of somebody that um, is like the most popular guy within our sport. Um, he actually had a reality show like years ago, big name. He's still driving in his 70s and he had a big crash and explosion um, that put him out sidelined in the hospital. Welcome to Baker's Victory. We got Jenna and Valerie Baker. We got Jack and Jake over there. And our special guest from the race car NHRA company called A N H R N H R A. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Can we get his name? How about that? Justin Ashley. Oh. There we go. I like it. That's a good intro. I'll take the intro. I appreciate you guys having me on. Thank he you. He takes it. Here's the thing, Justin. Acronyms are really hard for him. I have ADHD, and he switches up the letters almost every single time he tries to say it. Trust me on that. Yeah. <laughs> it's Justin, okay. It is good to have you here. Jenna got lots of questions to ask you. She got prepared a bit mom mom has I am so excited doing this interview for sure I I cannot believe it is I'm talking to a freaking race car pro race car driver race car driver there pro you go. professional race car driver yep yeah yes on, on yes. this very podcast I cannot believe it so NHRA is the National Hot Rod Association. Hot Rod, thank you. From Hot Rod, That's Justin, right. the National- Ashley. <laughs> there you go. You got it. The National Hot Rod Association. So you guys came out and you saw us in St. Louis. That was so race. much fun. It was so, so much fun. Yeah, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it's, it. It was funny because when they first came over and they introduced you, I'm like, wait a minute. I, I know this guy. I know this family. <laughs> they look very familiar. So between me and my fiance, we're like, hey, you know, we know Derek, we know Baker Banner, we know the whole thing. And I'm like texting her pictures of us. And she's like, no way. No way. <laughs> no He's way. here. I promise you. No way in hell. No, it's him. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> What's your fiance's name, Justin? Gina. 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 Why don't you give Gina a shout out? Well, hello, Gina. Yeah, I thought it was super cool when we, it was like we were getting introduced to you and then you're like, oh, I know you. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun yeah, for us. Yeah, that was really cool. It was nice. You know, like you never know who you're going to come across, but I think it's cool what you guys do because you're putting smiles on people's faces, right? That's a pretty neat deal. Yeah. Well, and I think you guys do too. I literally could not wipe the smile off my face that afternoon in Illinois. It was so much fun. I mean, I've never done. I've never been to um, I, a race car or a, a, you any know, event, any kind of car, got, real car racing. My a friend of ours used to race years ago, I and got, he did. He raced on a dirt track. Okay. Here locally, and we went one time, and I remember getting pelted by like dirt claws <laughs> at that. That was that was probably thirty years ago, probably before Jenna was even born. So. Just a really cool thing that you guys do, and I was I was just so interested in everything um, that we were told and and all the, that we learned. Yeah, all the things that we learned, and yep. it was yeah. it was just a lot of fun. My first question is, how how you got interested in a high rod? That's a good question. That's that a is a great question. question. Yeah, so I actually get that a lot. So I grew up around the sport. So my father raced in a category called funny car for many years. So I spent a lot of time as a kid with him traveling across the country to all these different racetracks. And from the time I was young, I just fell in love with the sport. I fell in love with the people, the sound, the speed, and pretty much everything in between. So from the time I was probably about 11, which is when I first drove a race car, which mind you probably went about 30 miles an hour at the time, I knew that this is you know what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So 
Um, just an easy, easy kind of sport to fall in love with. Well, on that note, Jenna, you want to ask your first question? Well, thank you, Derek. I would love to. You actually asked one of my questions, so I think that's really cool. That was a good question, Derek. But what I wanted to say was I, I know for us, and there's probably a lot of people like us who – haven't experienced the race before and that was our first time so just if if you were explaining you know the the group that you're with and and what happens in an event that you are racing at like how would you explain that to a first timer yeah so we race the fastest accelerating vehicles on the planet so our cars go zero over 330 miles per hour in under four seconds which equates to about 12,000 horsepower. So on the surface, the speed is one thing, but it's the accelerations, how quickly you actually get it from point A to point B. So we're racing in a straight line for about a thousand feet, one car in the right lane and one car in the left lane. Um, We race about 20 times a year all across the country. Each race is streamed online and each race is televised on Fox. But to really experience it, you have to be there. It's just one of those sports. It's a sensory experience because not only can you smell it, not only can you see if you can actually feel it, and I know you guys can attest to this, you can actually feel it in your chest when these cars go down the racetrack because they're just legitimately that powerful. And the other cool thing is every ticket's kind of a pit pass. You get to kind of walk through the pit area and engage with the teams, engage with the drivers, talk with people, communicate. And I think that's a really neat aspect of our sport, but it's just, it's so powerful. It's so sensory. Um, and most of the people who go, we usually end up having them come back at least a second or a third time. And are all 20 races in the States? They are. So they're all across the United States, anywhere from East Coast around like New Hampshire, Pennsylvania area, all the way out to the West Coast um, around California. But they're all within the United States. Well, well, that is very, very cool for that part. But I am very interested in, in this question, Justin. I heard you have a wrestling ring there. <laughs> I have. What is that? A wrestling ring. Well, you didn't hear. You saw. You went into it. There was a there was a wrestling ring set up at the event in Illinois. Oh, that I didn't. They might have set that up specially for you, Derek. I don't. I didn't know about that. <laughs> so that's did not go, always at in every it? event. It's not always at every event. Did you Did you go in it? I actually did. Actually, it was <laughs> very cool. I gotta know how many. I don't know how many. The, W superstars got interested into the hot rod. It's like how many how many drivers do we have? In other words, how many WWE superstars got interested in in car racing? Are you oh, a, how many? Yeah, are you familiar with any? How many WWE any? superstars are into like hot rod racing? Yeah, yeah, I think that's what he's asking. Um, aside from you, um, I don't know. I don't. You know, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. I know that there's been like a bunch of celebrities and athletes that have come out to the racetrack. And you'll hear my dog in the background. I'm sorry, but like football, baseball, basketball. I don't know that we've ever had any wrestlers, but we actually did way back in the day in the '90s. There was actually a car that was sponsored by WWE. Wow. And they had, I'll have to send you a picture. They had two special cars. I think one with Kane on it. And wow. maybe another with the rock on it, um, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to send you a picture. But they had these in like probably the late wow. 90s or the early 2000s. Since then, not much. But there were two very big WWE sponsored race cars. Wow. That is super cool. And I, yeah. I, it sounds like the event we went to was kind of special that it had wrestling involved. It was the it was actually, Southern Illinois Wrestling Company or something like that. My question you did mention The Rock and Kane earlier got sponsored on the car. Did the red machine Kane and The Rock notice about the car? They did. They actually came out to, I think, one or two races throughout the year. And they spent wow. time at the racetrack. So that was a really cool experience. I okay, wasn't there, but from so what I hear, cool. yeah. Yeah, it was that really, really so cool. cool. So I would like to know how many drivers there are. Yeah, so there are, a, there's like thousands, right, all across the country. Thousands. But when you get to the, what they call like the NHRA professional level, there are four categories. There's top fuel and funny car. 
And then there's pro stock and pro stock motorcycle, which are bikes. Um, so I would say give or take full time ish. There's between 20 and 25 drivers and teams in each category. So in each professional category in total, I'm sure there's between 75 and 100 total professional drivers. So how do you determine which type of car you're going to drive? I think it's really opportunity like anything else. Like I think, you know, like how I ended up in top fuel was the right opportunity presented itself between partners, between team members, um, between sponsors and ownership groups. So I think I kind of grew up racing those WWE. Yeah. Like the, so the top fuel cars are the long skinny cars that come with the parachutes that come out the back. So I always drove those kind of long dragsters. So I kind of naturally fell into it. And those were the people I was surrounded with and the teams and the partners that I was surrounded with. It tends to be a family sport too. So people, you know, second, third generation. So they kind of know what they want to drive and, and they see if their visions align with others. So could you drive a funny car? I could. Um, yeah. It would be a different category. Right. Um, you know, and funny car drivers can drive in top fuel and vice versa. But it's a totally different skill set, believe it or not. One car uh, has the motor and the engine in the front and has a much shorter wheelbase as opposed to the other one, which has the motor in the back and a longer wheelbase. So they just drive differently. Um, you would still have to get actually a separate license to do that. But it's been done. There are people that have won. Uh, across multiple different categories, actually. So you actually have a license that makes you like eligible to drive this type of car? Correct. Yep. Hmm. yep. Now, one of the things that I found really interesting in, uh, we talked to so many people that day, so I cannot remember who, t who said this, but they said that pretty much after every single time that you run your race, and I know it was like less than four seconds, I looked you up, you went your top speed, I think, was 338 miles an hour. Correct, yeah. That's insane. <laughs> so less than four seconds, okay, 338 miles per hour, and then you take the car back to your area, or I guess you call that your pit, maybe, and yeah. then you, re you have to rebuild the engine every single time? Yeah, that's amazing. So we have like 10 to 12 guys on our team that do that, and it's like a coordinated dance. So every time we go down the racetrack, they bring it back and they have to do it in as quick as like 45 or 50 minutes sometimes to be able to get it back up there and do it again. So they will take the whole car apart, bring it all the way down to the block and rebuild the whole thing, rods, pistons and, and everything in between in a short period of time. So they all know what their specific job is and they're able to work with each other and get it done. So um, it's, it's pretty cool. We kind of tag team it and work on it together, like some of the stuff you probably see in WWE. So what's the nice. purpose like, why is that necessary? Because just how powerful it is. So it takes such a beating. Um, the parts and pieces just take a beating because it's so violent and so powerful that they don't have the ability to last um, as long as they might otherwise. So that's why they have to take everything apart, inspect it, um, and put new new things in. So they're really replacing basically all the parts in the motor for the most More part. so. Um, yeah, mostly for the most part. There's some stuff that can stay or might last more than other things but generally especially in the motor area you're replacing pretty much everything so the other question i had that so we we knew nothing like we had no expectation oh. of anything and we um i did have an expectation i expected the cars to go fast yeah okay well we expected that we expected <laughs> it to be loud too and it, yeah, it did true. not disappoint so um our friends uh david who works for the nhra uh, he actually went to high school with Katie. So they allowed us to uh, watch the race from basically the tower at the start. So we the were media kind of tower. the media tower over the start. So that's where that was our vantage point. Right. So we saw you coming behind us because, you know, we could see you and we knew when you were going and everything. So. The thing that I found interesting, or one of the things I found interesting, and I'm just curious as to why you all do it that way, is the two cars, the two hot rods, I guess, would get to the start line. You'd both punch it hard and go, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 feet, and then you'd back up. So what was the purpose of that exercise? Because every single car seemed to do the same thing. Yeah, so that's what we call a burnout. So... Simply, it's done just to warm up the tires. Okay. Um, these cars have a lot of power, and it's all about traction. 
And in order to help maintain that traction, all the cars will do that burnout 30, 40 feet, back up, and then race the cars themselves. So theoretically, you can make a pass without a burnout, but you're going to give yourself a much better opportunity to actually go down the racetrack without any issues and maintain traction if you do that. Okay. And then we noticed that there would be a couple of your crew that would be wiping the tires down. They were wearing like what looked like special gloves. Yeah. So was that cooling the tires down or was that trying to heat them up or what, what were, what were they doing? So they are wearing special gloves um, because everything on the car is hot, but that is simply just to get anything that might have, that the tires themselves might've picked up from the racetrack off the tires. Like a, um, like so a rock or something, like a pebble. A or rock, whatever. rubber, um, that's not supposed to be there. Any chunks that it might have picked up, anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So does it get hot inside where you sit? Yeah, very much so. Um, so it's like an enclosed space and it's very, very tight because you're going so fast. So between, you wear like a ton of equipment. So we wear, you know, like a head sock, another head sock, then the helmet, under gloves, then regular gloves. Um, a really, really thick fire suit, all kinds of special fire retardant undergarments. So by the time you're done putting everything on, they strap you back really tight in a confined space. It gets really hot really quick. I mean, I, I, it kind of reminds me of like sitting in a sauna or something like that. I don't know what the temperature actually is. I got to look at that, but it definitely jacks up the heart rate a little bit and it gets warm. Thankfully, you're not in there that long. You probably get in around 10, 15 minutes before you race, but it feels like a long time. That's, I was just going to ask, how long are you yeah. in there? So if I, so when did you get in the car? Like we saw you all, and I know we're just looking at the one racetrack we were at, but we saw you guys kind of pulling in. Did you drive it all the way in or did somebody else drive it in and then you hop in it at some point? How did that work? Yeah, so we get up to the area, which is like, let's say the holding area, which is called the staging lanes. So that's where all the cars come up and wait. We actually don't start the car until we're on the starting line. So we tow it up. So we have a Toyota Sequoia. We attach it to a tow strap, which hooks up to the car, and we'll tow it up like you would tow a normal car. Okay. And we don't actually fire it up and start it up until it's our turn to go. So we're all waiting there together until it's our turn. But we have a rule, and I think most drivers kind of are in the same area, where five pairs before it's our turn to run. The drivers start getting ready and get in the car, which generally takes about, I'll give you about 15 minutes or so, 10 or 15 minutes before it's actually your turn. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. It was so loud the first time we heard it. We were up on that thing. I mean, I, we all had the protective ear gear in, but I, it I was mean, mind blowing. I'm surprised you can hear. It's so loud. It and is. you hear that over and over and over, you know, as a driver. Yeah. How do it's you protect your bad. ears? So believe it or not, it's not as bad in the car as it is outside of the car. I kind it's of think that. Yeah. Yeah. It's much worse outside of the car. Um, it's just so like incredibly loud. But inside the car, it's certainly, it's loud, but it's definitely quieter and you kind of get used to it um, like anything else. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely, it's just the feeling of it though. You're talking about about five and a half to six G's that you actually feel inside the race car. Um, something like sitting in a rocket ship or, uh, or something like that's probably the best way to describe it. So, oh, go ahead, mom. No, I was just going to ask you about some of the, uh, workers in the pit, right? The, your team, they didn't appear to have like any sort of headphones on or any protective earwear. Were they, did they have something like that was in their ears that you couldn't see? Most of them do. Most of them have little like earpieces that are custom made that they'll keep inside of their ears and they'll just put them in like this and take them out. Um, so they have a little, some, a little in there. I don't know how they do it, to be honest with you. Like, I guess you become used to it kind of over time, but it's just so loud. They do have their earpieces in, but it's still, still pretty loud. Yeah. I, I mean, I expected it to be loud. It was definitely louder than I expected, but I didn't expect to feel it the way you feel it in your body. And it like literally rattles the inside of your person. And like, it it feels like your bones are rattling. Like that's how forceful it is. And, you know, we're three stories up from where we were watching. So I, we were looking down at the the crews being like, how are they doing this? (laughs) it, It just seems like it would be so overwhelming. 
it's it's a lot. It's a lot to take in, especially for the first time. So the crew is used to it because they do it so much, 20 races a year. But for the normal fan, it's a pretty wild. Like, that's why I recommend, like, you can watch it on Fox, but you have to be there for that reason. Yeah. Because of, like, exactly what you're describing. You actually almost, like, feel your bones rattling. You get that sensation and that vibration um, that you don't really get anywhere else. Like, I'm sure you guys have been to other sports whether it's wwe or football baseball basketball and the energy in the building is amazing but this is just different this is like every sport has the thing that makes it tick and this is kind of what makes nhra go so are the cars that you drive the fastest of the four types they are yes yeah and then in the motorcycles they don't go quite as fast as the cars no so they go about 200 miles per hour in about six and a half seconds, which on a bike, even in a car, but it's super fast, but everything's relative, right? So like the top fuel and the funny car, they're the ones that go over 330 miles per hour in under four seconds. Those are the fastest that we race and the fastest accelerating vehicles on the planet. So the day before we were at the racetrack, it had been raining all day. So what happens for you guys in the rain? It's super boring. <laughs> we can't <laughs> we, we can't do much at all. So we have a lot of guests that we have that we spend time with. Um, so we enjoy doing that part of it on behalf of our sponsors and partners. But other than that, it's a lot of downtime, um, checking the radar and checking the weather, hoping that it clears up. Yeah, you per- you can't drive those in the rain. I mean, I can't imagine. That would be so dangerous, I would think. No, any kind of rain, they can't do it. That's the only thing they can't. Any kind of rain, it's got to stop. So how do they, how would they, like, if it were to have stopped raining and then they wanted to start driving, like, is there a, is there a way they, like, kind of dry the track more quickly? Or how does that, do you just have to, like, let nature run its course? Yeah, so they have specific tools that they use to dry the track. When it rains a lot, like you saw in St. Louis, it takes two hours, maybe even three hours to actually get the track fully dry. So the problem with St. Louis, it was kind of like, even if it would stop, it would still sprinkle, which would keep water on it. But yeah, they have special instruments and tools and it just takes some time, but they get it all done. I have a question. What's your favorite racetrack? Um, Where's your favorite place to run? Yeah, I would probably say Charlotte. Um, There's a racetrack in Charlotte and Concord specifically that is just beautiful. Like it's a beautiful facility. It's clean. All of them for the most part are super nice and we like racing there, but Charlotte, it's called Z-Max Dragway in Concord, North Carolina. Um, we've had a lot of success there as a team, but um, the fans are really, really good there, really knowledgeable, and the facility itself is super nice. So we have a lot of like good memories there. It's a place that we always like to go. Do most of the tracks that you race have the dual purpose like uh, the one in Illinois did? So they had your you know straight track, and then they had the big grandstand with the oval track. Do most of them house both types of racing? No, not most. I would say about five or six maybe out of the 20 have that, where they're kind of like motorsports facilities where they'll have a circle track or a dirt track or go-karts and the actual drag strip. But probably about five or six of them do. Um, The rest of them generally are just built for drag racing and for that reason. Okay. Are you the only driver for your team or is there more than one? So... There's more than one. So our team is called Skag Racing because it's owned and sponsored by a company called Skag Power Equipment. So they make zero turn lawnmowers um, all across the country. So between our team, we have three drivers. Um, I am the only driver in Top Fuel and I'm the only one who drives that car. Then there's two other funny cars. One's driven by someone named Dave Richards and the other by Daniel Wilkerson. So each person sticks to their own car but I do have two other teammates that we race with under the same umbrella as well. Okay. So, so why are they called funny cars? Literally because they look funny. (laughs) That's literally, I'm pretty sure how it started is they're called funny cars because they, they look funny. They're short. Um, They just don't look like your average cars. Were they the ones that kind of like the whole branded part like comes up and then, yes, Yes. Am I thinking of the right thing? Yeah. So there's the chassis. There was really just the two cars. There was the long one that Justin drives, and then there was the one that looked more like a car car. Yeah. 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 But it like the the whole whole top top comes up. up. Yeah. And that's that's the body. So they'll lift it up and take it off the car and then put it back on. 
Yeah. I have two questions for the cars where you, you, you guys drive. One, how loud is it? Like, is there a decibel? Do they know? They how? know. I think that it's it's. I don't know exactly what the decibel is. It's 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 high. I don't know what it is. It's not nearly as loud in the car, but outside the car, it's super high. I don't know the exact number. How loud does the car sound like that? Like, how loud is it it's down below or way up, up high? It's yeah, I high. think it's interesting. They, they sound different in different places. Like, we'll go to Bristol, Tennessee and race there. And because it's in between literally two mountains, it's in like a valley it like echoes and vibrates off the mountains and actually sounds louder there than it does at a wow. place like St. Louis. I mean, it's loud wherever you go, but it kind of depends on where we're racing. I don't need it to be any louder. Well, <laughs> that is very interesting. And I did feel the smoke and the fire. What the heck is that about? Like, <laughs> look, I gotta know what the... The car get, got got released at the fire and the smoke could come out. Yes. When I saw saw that, I was fly with smoke. <laughs> I got to know what's, what happened there. What happened when when that fire. In, the car come out when the fire came out of the, the back of the car. Out. Yeah, so the cars will generally we have what we call headers on the side of each car. So when the car takes off at night, you can see it a little bit better than the day. But it, at you know when you're running these cars, you'll see what they call header flames, which are fire that actually comes out of the side of the car as you go down the racetrack, just from all the power and all the violence of it. And then these cars, obviously, you think okay, they go straight but they don't always want to go straight. Um, they don't always maintain power or traction. So you'll f see things like actual fires either inside or outside of the race car, or the tires will shake or smoke will come off the tires just because um, there's a lot of data and information that really goes into it, but it's very hard to maintain and control that kind of power. So that unpredictability could lead to those fires or smoke or something like that. So are you seeing kind That's of like, I don't know if it's like a mistake or like, you know, a malfunction maybe like if, if we're seeing fire like that, like, is that something kind of backfiring or is it somewhat typical to see that sort of thing? Um, it, it, it depends. It's just like, it happens. Like it's a, I wouldn't say it's an atypical thing. Like it happens, um, more frequently than not, you're going to go down the racetrack and everything's going to be okay. But in certain situations that will that will definitely happen. We see it with our car and, and we certainly see it with others as well. I, um, I noticed a few of the cars where it seemed like they had that like initial, I don't know what you want to call punch. it, like punch. Yeah. And then it did kind of seem like something like backfired or, or there was a mishap and they like didn't make it down as fast as others. Is that something that you can kind of like, tell from the inside when something went wrong and then maybe you don't like try to ex continue to accelerate or like how do you know from the inside what's going on absolutely so that's part of what makes a good driver is their feel and their ability to react in a really short period of time so when things don't go according to plan it's up to the driver to take his foot off the pedal and then maybe even put it back on the pedal if he still thinks he has a chance to win the race just to get the car to settle down a little bit more and give himself a chance. But yeah, you can definitely feel that when something's not right in the car. And that's kind of what separates drivers, especially from this level, you know, at this level, some are better than others. Some fall somewhere in between, but you can definitely know um, when something doesn't feel right. Did I, how many teams are there? Did I ask you that? Yeah, there's about 20 to 25 per category between okay. teams and drivers. And yeah. 
I, the the only real like knowledge I had of racing before meeting you guys is my my fiance follows F one pretty closely, and okay. I know with them they have like kind of like a system where you know teams get points and then at the end there is like a winner of the season. Is there something like that in the NHRA? Like, is there are are you competing for like the top score at the end of the season, or what does that look like for you guys? Yeah, there is. So we have 20 races. The first 14 races are our regular season. So based on how you do at each event, you accumulate a certain number of points. And then the top 10, let's say generally the top 10 make what's called the playoffs. So after the first 14 races that cut off our regular season and we have a six race playoff for the people in like the top 10 to top 12, And we're in the middle of our six race playoff right now. And then based on how you do during those races, same thing. You accumulate a certain number of points and whoever has the most points at the end of the year is the champion. So how are you looking this year? We're first. So that's good. (gasps) Wow. Congratulations. I appreciate it. Thank you. So we're number one. We still have two races left. So there's like a long way to go. And there's still a lot of really good cars that could still win the championship. But right now, so far, so good. Have you ever won the championship before? I have never. So this is my fifth year in top fuel in this category. We finished fourth literally three years in a row. So hopefully um, we can buck that trend in a good way. That's what we're hoping. So so when are the last two races? We'll have to keep an eye on it. So next one is in Las Vegas, which is Halloween weekend. Um, I think it's like November 1st. Yeah. And then uh, the other one is in Pomona, California. Uh, that I believe is like the around the 14th of November. So we're getting there. All right. We'll need to put those on the calendar. You said we can watch them on Fox. Yeah. So they'll all be on either Fox or I think these two are probably on Fox Sports. Okay. More than likely. Yeah. I think today, actually, I was curious myself because I am I know a little bit about WWE. I know, Derek, you know a lot more than I do. But do they have some kind of point system when they wrestle to like determine a champion or is it not? Is it just separate? Um. Some people are champions, like the ring general Gunther, and there's no points though. There's no points. No. Real tag team. No, but they do have things. I don't think there's there's no points for wrestling, but they do have different matches that qualify you for things. Like for example, the in January they have the Royal Rumble. And whoever wins the Royal Rumble typically has a shot at the title at WrestleMania because they won at Royal Rumble. So, but okay. it, it, it changes and there's, you know, there's different teams and different storylines and different teams breaking up and different teams forming and it's, it's drama. WWE is all about the drama. It's kind of like, like that. It was dramatic. Right before we started talking to you, I was afraid Derek was going to come on here and be mean to you because he was yelling at me at the end of our wrestling podcast. Oh, no. I, I got lucky. I got lucky. One yeah, day I'm like, okay, you okay. Lucky today, I know you were a little I heated, did. but you you can't yell at Justin, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You can yell at me. Don't Am I worry. Nice to him, Jenna? You're being nice to him. No, I you're appreciate being awesome. that. Good, good. You, you had a really good question. Very nice. Too. I mean, thank you. Move on. So I did want to know, I, I thought it was kind of funny, and I think I did talk about this when we uh, recapped our NHRA experience, but the tires are so big. Like two of them, you let us come into that um, trailer, trailer where they yeah. remake the motor and whatnot and have all the parts and that sort of thing. And Derek was standing next to the tires and like two of them stacked on top of each other were almost as tall as Derek was. But what I was curious about is like, how how long do the tires last? Like, do they get switched out at, at every race or, or how does that work? So generally, if things go according to plan, they'll last anywhere between eight and 10 runs for one tire. Um, but things can happen where it just gets all beat up and it can only last one run or two runs or three or four. But generally, we hope for between eight and 10 runs for one tire. And that's Literally the most common thing, like people, like fans will come and they'll ask for rods, pistons, like old parts and pieces. But like the most common thing that they ask for is a tire from the race car. Oh my gosh, they're Those so are huge. big. Yeah. They're well, huge. I guess the front ones aren't as big. Yeah. Yeah. They ask for the back ones though. The ones that like you feel like you can put yourself in it and roll down. Yes. That's, yes, those. 
Yes, they're massive. Like two of them stacked on top of each other was almost as tall as Derek. It was kind of hilarious. They're huge. They're massive. And I just saw L- L- London Timpton was in a tower, in a tire <laughs> before. On a Disney Channel show. Ah. And, and was she rolled the across light? the screen in a tire. His tires would work. Was it the sweet Zach and Cody? Yeah. Yeah. Remember you yeah. told him about it when we were there. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Justin, when are you getting married? Do you have a uh, date She set? actually just walked in now. It's funny you said it. So we're getting ah. married December 2025. Okay. Well, yeah. that's pr- pretty cool. Congratulations. I'm getting married in 2025 as well. Oh, congratulations. That's Thanks. awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Wow. I'm Are you in, excited? I am excited. It, I'm in March and it's like, I'm like, oh, it's it's coming quickly. All of a sudden for a long time, it was like, oh, we got plenty of time. And now all of a sudden it's like, okay, I don't feel like we have plenty of time anymore. <laughs> I know. It goes so quick. So, so does that, that means that now, now is your sister married yet? No, 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 she's younger than me. I'm the oldest. Okay, okay so she's younger. So this is the so Derek's gonna have a brother-in-law then officially yes. for the first. Time. Yes, yep. and I am so excited. What's your title in the Chris wedding? Down. Man of honor. He is the man of honor. Wow, man of That's honor. A- it's kind of like second best man. Yep. So- yeah. He was a little <laughs> upset when he found out he wasn't gonna be the best man, and I'm like, okay, but Derek, Chris has a brother. Like, right. You know, I mean, if Chris didn't have a brother, it, this could be a totally different conversation. But he has a brother. I'm like, he he, he has a built-in best man, He's got the first best man in his player. And he's got his second best man, and that's me. So I'm totally right. honored. Yeah, you're totally honored. It comes honored. with a lot of responsibilities, so you got to be ready for that, too. Yeah. he Derek's going to have a lot of responsibilities. His biggest responsibility is the hype man on the dance floor. Nice, nice. He's good at that. Oh, Are you? Dude, oh, we, may yeah. have to, we may have to hire you to come to our wedding then to get everybody hyped up. I don't know. <laughs> He's very good at being a hype person at the at weddings. Yeah. He does a great job at that. I actually have a friend getting married in like a week and a half and the whole family's invited and I've made jokes. I'm like, I'm pretty sure she only invited my whole family because she wants Derek there. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I nice. do She's love Hannah. She's awesome. I know. I know. So when you, okay, I want to backtrack. You mentioned that you have to have like a license for yes. these cars. What, like, what does that entail? How do you get one? Can anyone try to get one? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. So it depends. It, it looks different based on category because you have the four professional categories, but even before that, the licensing is different per category and you have so many different, you know, hundreds of different categories across different forms of motorsports. So generally for like our category, um, you have to make what they call like six passes down the racetrack within a certain amount of time. So you have to generally speak with a team, see if you can put together some kind of relationship or deal where you will use their car to actually license and make those six runs in that specific, like meet that requirement for speed and meet that requirement for time. And then you have to have three professional drivers there with you on site that will actually sign off on it and put their name on it saying, okay, like this guy's good. We met the requirements and, you know, we feel comfortable saying he can move forward and race. So it's quite the process. How do you, or or do you like, is there a practice that goes into this? Like, how does that work? It's a really difficult thing to practice. Um, right. We have what we call like test sessions, which is like practices before the year. And then during the year after select races, like after our last, after our next race in Las Vegas, the Monday following, we'll actually stay at the track and test different parts and pieces and practice there before our that's final fu- race. That was actually funny when you mentioned Las Vegas. That's exactly what WrestleMania Res- is going to be next year. In April in, of 2025. Yeah, in April of 20, 2025. I am so, so excited for that, <laughs> by the way. Besides that, my last question of this awesome interview with Mr. Justin Ashlyn. My, 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 my last question for you, buddy. When... You 
got started in the hot rod. How long have you been a professional? How long have you been a professional hot rod? What does it take to to get to that point? Trevor. So it's kind of like, so it's my fifth year racing professionally in Top Fuel. Wow. And it's kind of like, like minor league baseball is what I equate it to. So we have different categories that are like single A, double A, and triple A for us. So we'll start, I started when I was 11, racing junior dragsters and going 30 miles an hour. Then I went up to another category that went 200 miles an hour, another category that went 280 miles an hour. And that process took a long time from the time I was 11 until the time I was in my early 20s, around 24 years old. Um, And then I went into top fuel. So it's just a matter of working your way up, winning some races, developing relationships and finding yourself a good team. So um, that's where we're at now. But you're in the A league now. This is the top league. Yeah. The top. Yeah. This is the top. uh, He's in the major league baseball now. Yeah. Well, that was very awesome for you, buddy. (laughs) So he made he made the raw roster. You're welcome. So when did so the last race is? You may finish up, Jenna. Okay, thank you. So how how much squares do you have, by the way? I I just got a couple more. Is that is that gonna be okay? Take your time. Okay, I don't have softball tonight. Oh, lucky you. Okay. <laughs> uh, I got an NXT. I got a wrestling and I just did. Oh, yeah. He's oh, yeah, been wrestling baby. about six days a week. So, you know. I love it. You're, wait, um, he's wrestling or he's watching wrestling? He's no, no, watching. No. I'm he's, watching wrestling. He's got a date with the TV. Uh, I got a date with <laughs> the TV tonight. <laughs> okay. Cool. The only weeknight where he doesn't fight us on plans is Thursdays. Because every other night there is wrestling on TV and there's also okay. wrestling on Saturdays. <laughs> and every once in a while you get a pay per view event on a Sunday. So it's, there are it's some a lot weeks where it's literally six days a week and we're like, okay, bro, chill. I keep wrestling in line and <laughs> mom put me in line. So <laughs> at least we're fit. I try. <laughs> give me, give me in, we're fit. So the <laughs> last. Give me in, we're fit. The last race of the season. The last race of the season's mid November. When does the season begin? Uh, begins around February, so it's about oh. February to November. So, do you? What do you do during those off months? Is that like your off season? You get to go do cool vacations and stuff. Somewhat. And get married. You're, and get married. Yes. Yeah. And get married. That's the most get important married. thing. Yeah. The most important thing is to get married and stay married. So that's number yeah. one. Yeah. Number two is, yeah, we try and take the opportunity to spend some time with friends and family, but there's not really that much time off, honestly. Like yeah. in the off season, it's like, let's say two and a half months. But even during that period of time, we have trade shows, um, you know, stuff on the business side of racing that we have to take care of and just prep, honestly, for the next year, because there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. But um, we do try and spend some time to get away. My fiance and I are actually going to Mexico like the first week in January. So that'll be nice. 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 Yeah. So is there a, really cool. a lot of turnover with the racing, like the race drivers, or does it stay pretty consistent? Um, there's turnover, especially within the teams themselves. Um, people frequently switch um, and go from team to team, but the best teams, in my opinion, and I think everyone will tell you the same thing, the best teams are the ones that have been together for a long time. Uh, fortunately, We've had the same guys for a long time and we're performing at a pretty high level right now. So I think that's a big part of it because you have a very short period of time to put everything together on the car and to make sure that everything's correct. And just like any other sport or any other team, you got to have the right culture. So um, I think the best teams are the ones that stick together, but there is kind of a lot of tar- a lot of turnover there. Have you worked for, or have you always been with Skag or? Actually, no, it's my first year with Skag. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just want to clap for that. First year with Skag, first year in first yeah. place. I know, that's really cool. Oh, by the way, this is actually the last question for you. Do you ever lose it to Fifth Harmony? <laughs> no, Do I don't, actually. I don't, I don't. Should well, I, though? You should. They got great music. My favorite is Damon E. Um, worth it. Yeah. Give it to me, I'm worth, worth it. it. That that's what he yes. was singing earlier. Baby, I'm Matt, worth it. <laughs> listen, if I'm able to hire you and you can come to the wedding to be the hype man, I will play that song at least three times throughout the night. Oh my. <laughs> he does like that song a lot. Yeah. What's the typical longevity for a driver, Justin? 
Um, it depends. I think, you know, drivers can drive till they're, you know, honestly in their sixties and seventies, if they want to, it doesn't happen too frequently. Um, but you know, you'll have people have nice, like, you know, 10 to, to 20 year careers. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Do you, um, I know like, it, it, is there crashes in? There is. Drive? Thank God. Thank God myself. Um, I haven't had one. I had a few close calls, um, unfortunately because of my own doing, but, uh, there are, there are some pretty nasty ones, some pretty bad ones. Um, actually John force is the name of somebody that, um, is like the most popular guy within our sport. Um, he actually had a reality show like years ago, big name. He's still driving in his seventies and he had a big crash and explosion, um, that put him out landed in the hospital just is earlier. This okay. Day. He's okay. Thank God he's okay. But it was a scary situation. Um, that was over the summer. So things like this happen. Um, thankfully these cars are built so well now because of all the advancements in technology that people are much safer now than they've ever been. But certainly, um, there's risk associated with what we do. If you were to give advice to somebody who wants to be a driver someday, what, what would you tell them? Um, depending on age, I would tell them to try and get involved on any level first. So whether it's as a crew person that actually works on the car or maybe in our hospitality tent, working with different partners, I think the best way to get involved is to start by getting in with the team. And then once you're in with that team work and develop those relationships and meet people and try and understand the business side of it. And then from that point, I think, um, you know, it's almost like an internship, right? You work your way in and do what you're supposed to do and um, get the right recommendations and then uh, get your shot along the way. And how do you get like a specific sponsor? Is that all just kind of like relationship building too? It is. That's a lot of it. Um, you know, we're spent a lot of time on it really specifically over the last like seven years or so. And we've had a lot of really good ones, um, but far and away now, you know, with our relationship with Skag Power and Equipment, this is the best sponsor we've ever had. And it's not even close because, you know, obviously the way they operate by giving us the parts and pieces that we need, but they surround us with the right people. And, you know, it's a family, you know, we treat each other great and that's what it's all about. So I think it's just relationship building, um, speaking with people, understanding how you can be of value to somebody and understanding that it's more than just putting a name on the side of the race car. It's the actual return on investment and how you could actually use that platform effectively to help sponsors make money. Um, and I think having a better understanding of that and knowing that each company has different objectives, depending on what they're trying to accomplish, generally it puts you in a good position to meet the right people. Yeah. One of the things that I took away that I was certainly surprised by was, and, and I think this did have to do with where we were watching from was the ash and I didn't realize like that it was happening until I looked at Katie and then she looked at me and I was like, you have dirt on your face. And she's like, you have dirt on your face. <laughs> yes. And it was actually like coming up from like dirty Don. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yes. He'd be right at home there. Wouldn't so you, Derek? I, I do <laughs> think that could have had to have been because of where we were because we were up and like directly behind the cars. So maybe that's not a typical experience for just like anybody coming to see a, a show. But, but that was one thing that I was like, Oh, <laughs> there's dirt all over my face. Yeah. That's like a telltale sign that you got close to the race car. Like that's yeah. how you know if you have all that rubber and dirt on your face and it takes, you got it. So like the key that I've learned is makeup wipes to get it off. Cause it's like, it'll like stay on there for a while too. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Katie and I both accidentally let it stay in our shirts. So yeah, whoops. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. So well, the smoke, smoke didn't did get, get my eyes a little. Yeah, the smoke yeah, was intense make you tear a couple up times. And stuff too. Yeah, it, yeah, well, it, it did. It did Trust make me. us tear up. I was yeah. really surprised by the number of people I saw just not even wearing any protective ear gear. Yeah, you got to be careful with that. Because later on in life, at some point, it comes back to bite you. Not if you're there once or twice, but like if you're there every weekend, like we are, we're probably pretty, we're trying to be pretty consciously aware of it because um, it, 
it, it gives your ears a, a beating, especially yeah. over time. So what are you doing when you're not on the racetrack? So, um, you know, personally, obviously spend a lot of time with friends and family and then preparing, honestly, like a lot of it is, this is my life. This is my career. So it's just a matter of physically, mentally staying in shape, making sure that I'm prepared for each race. Um, and then honestly, like just to get away anything on the water, like whether it's jet ski, boating, um, whatever it is, just to get away for me, peace of mind is being on the water. So we, we love doing that. And then he also watches Baker Banner on Instagram and TikTok. I do right? that. I didn't want to sound like overzealous, but I do that. <laughs> oh, my God. You have to see the video we posted today. Derek was so pissed at Katie's boyfriend. And I it's why? hilarious. I think oh. I saw that, actually. Were you sitting down at the table, right? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. It was a lot. Yeah. Did I you hear what he said? Say it again. I don't think you Ex-boyfriend. No. I don't think you get to break up with Katie's uh -oh. boyfriend. Yeah, 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 yeah. He he told him he's her ex boyfriend now because he was so pissed. I think he'll get over it. But Derek does tend to Not hold on to grudges sometimes. Derek's calling the shots now in that relationship. So yeah, he was pretty pretty mad. Um, but yeah, I you said you guys are located in Indianapolis, and most of the drivers yeah. are located there. Is that right? Yeah, most of them are located in Brownsburg, well, Indiana. That is in funny. Right there, you bring that up, Jen. Because do you know what's in Indianapolis soon? Royal Rumble. It is. In what year? Oh. 2025? When is that? Maybe in January. Or it's February it's, this year. It's February 1st. It's February 1st. Yeah. Wow. And I got, got it over you, Justin. Even, even though you're a big race car driver from, from, from this cool, awesome. NHRA. Awesome race car company called... Hot Rod, not, not just that, you're also a big, big racer, big racer fan, you used, used to be big racer fan, I got to know, Justin, I got to know, are you, are going to the Royal Rumble on February 1st in Nibiapolis, in oh Indianapolis? Gosh. <laughs> I don't know. Now I, I wasn't going to, but now I almost feel obligated to go after that. I don't, I don't know. Let me ask you this question. The one in April in Las Vegas, which one is that? WrestleMania. 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 Is that what, do you know when in April that is? Do you know the date? April 20th, I believe. It's okay. April 19th and 20th. Yeah. Well, we race in Las Vegas in April. So if they cross each other, and I happen to be around during that period of time in Vegas, then I want to go to that one. Yeah, wow. I will tell you, Royal Rumble might be my favorite event. Oh, really? agreed. Yeah, really? I it's, agree. It is my... absolutely insanity. It it, <laughs> it, it it makes no sense. It There is no rhyme <laughs> or reason to what is happening. It is pure chaos, but it is just so like, much fun. They take that E in <laughs> WWE incredibly seriously. And it is hilarious how ridiculous it is. The Royal <laughs> Rumble I specifically. To, I may have to do it. I, I yeah. it. So who, who's the best? Like, who am I supposed to be rooting for? Like, who's the favorite, the best one? Well, well, we love the Mysterios. We do love the Mysterios. For sure. I especially love Liv Morgan. Like, she's my girl. I love her to death. For sure. See, here's the thing about Royal Rumble. So there's 30. They have a men's Royal Rumble and a women's Royal Rumble. So there's 30 participants in the match. Yep. And how it starts is there's two wrestlers that begin the match. And then every 90 seconds, another wrestler enters the ring. And at the end of the match, there's one person left standing. And how you get eliminated is you... Both feet have to go over the top rope and then you land on the ground. And if you land on the ground, you're eliminated. But if you land on a chair that just happens to be ringside, you're still in. Yes. Or oh. if you go through the ropes, <laughs> like if you go under okay. the ropes and step on the ground, sometimes people or will you go land like, on another competitor that's yeah. on the ground. You're still in. It's okay. hysterical. But it is just absolute nonsense. And at, at any given time, there is like... 
15 wrestlers in the ring at once and they're all in their own separate corners and there's like two people pounding on three people and they're 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 insane. laying around like and then every 90 seconds the the te- the countdown comes on it goes from 10 to zero and, and the then crowd boom does the countdown the whole crowd yeah 10, nine, awesome. eight. oh it's it's insane it's, it's a lot of fun unbelievable i've never seen anything like you it but i like to go around Run around, and, and, and you can get part, part of this too, Justin. I got to know who will be the, the last man standing. <laughs> Next year, Royal Rumble. Oh, boy. I will go first. Okay, you go first. I'm just going to be Derek, Dominic, and <laughs> Finn. Derek as in himself, yeah. That's what I thought, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking. And Drew McIntyre and... I thought you said last man. You just named off four people. And Braun Breaker. That's the Okay, okay, that, that's enough. That's I got me. Derek Jenna, Baker with the win. First. Okay, I got Jey Uso. What? I got Derek Baker with the win. You heard it here first. Okay, what is your four? Who's gonna be? Who's, oh, you want four? Okay, I got Jay Uso, Dominic Mysterio, Sami Zayn, and oh god, oh god, um, Otis. Ooh, that's a good final four. Mom? Well, I got Derek Baker with the win. The assist from Dominic, Ray, and Cody Rhodes. Wow. How do you like that? Now you're going to make They Justin all do jumped it, out Justin because you are in wrestling. There. And he's uh, like, I don't even know four names. <laughs> I'm going to say what I, I think I was raised right. Then they told me mom's always right. So I'm going to go with whatever <laughs> mom said. That seems like the right decision. What she said. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What about you, Justin? What's your. Oh, oh, he just said he likes mine. I'm so, agreeing with, with your mom. Dom, I think she's right. Ray, Derek, and Cody. Yes. There you go. Well, Cody is already a champion. Okay. All right. All right. All Here's right. the thing we already <laughs> talked about our wrestling today. All right. We, we do have to wrap this up, though. I think I. I think I got all my questions in there. Oh, I do have one more. I think I kind of already asked you this, but I'm going to ask it again. Yeah. When you're in the car and actually I have two more. When you're in the car and you like what hit that, is, hit the gas for the first time, like what, what does it feel like? Madness. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty mad. much. It, it goes like so fast. I feel with, with, with Wesley every day. Yeah. <laughs> Madness. Yeah. Madness. See, so like, all the way. The cars actually go zero to a hundred in less than a second. So in the beginning, your mind is just trying to pretty much play catch up. So it's like naturally reacting to whatever's going on. Then as you go further down the racetrack, you can kind of, it slows down in your brain a little bit and all that stuff. But it's something like just sitting in a rocket ship and it just feels like everything is happening really, really fast. And you're kind of, I'm sure the power is right. just amazing. And you're just planted back. And it's all at that point, honestly, I mean, experience is huge in this, but it's feel and like just your body naturally reacting to what's going on and trying to make the right decisions in like a split, split second. Yeah, because the whole thing's over in four seconds. That's it. It's insane. It. So much it's can It's got to be the fastest crazy. sport on the planet, right? It Less is. Less than four seconds? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's even yeah. faster than like the, you know, the, the bulls. Oh yeah, well those are eight seconds. I know. The, you got, I and mean, if you double, if you ride in the bull, yeah. you got to last eight seconds. So it's right. double that. That yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. insane. So I was surprised the first time just because I wasn't expecting it, and then I realized that all the cars did it. But the the parachutes that come out at the end has yes. has that always been the case, or like what's the story about those? Always. So that's what's used to slow the car down. Yeah. So we have either a lever or a button inside the car that'll have the parachutes come out the back when we cross the finish line that we either push or clicks to make sure the parachutes come back and actually slow the car down because they're going so fast at such a high rate of speed. That's the only thing that'll really slow them down with enough time. So you actually have to hit that yourself. You do. So we driver. like, yeah, so we have it. They have safety systems on the car that can set it up to automatically come. So they're supposed to automatically come out. 
But as drivers, we do it anyway because we never really want to rely on that or be right. dependent on it. It's more of in like a God forbid emergency situation. Yeah. So are but, you yeah. ever braking or is it just kind of like you hit the gas and then you hit the parachutes? So we hit the, yeah, so we hit the gas, then we hit the parachutes and then we, it's actually a handbrake. So okay. we'll pull the parachute lever and grab the handbrake here and like start to slow the car down after the parachutes come out. So after they come out, that gets it stopped pretty quick, but it doesn't just stop short. It keeps rolling. So then you kind of get on the brake and like easy, easy, easy so the car can slow down totally. Oh my gosh. It's just so incredible. It is. It was so cool. I do have to ask though, how did you find Baker Banner? <laughs> how did I find it? Yeah. I just... think, all right. Can you, when did you guys start the pay? It had to be during COVID, no? Yeah, yeah it was. was. Yeah, it was okay. 2020. Yeah. Cause I think that's when I found it because I wasn't doing anything. Like I, you know, you're on yeah. TikTok and looking for something to make you laugh or something to make you smile. So I don't know that it was in, it was right around that period of time, give or take that, you know, TikTok and now Instagram, right? And all this stuff really started to use it and stuff like that. So I think I just probably came across it on like a for you page or whatever, looking through and finding funny videos. And I was like, all right, you know, this is pretty neat. And then you go through and look at the rest of the videos on the page and, you know, like you become attached isn't the right word, but you would start to understand people like you and your personalities and stuff like that. So then when you upload a new video, it's kind of cool. So that's kind of how it all started. Well, we appreciate that. I did, I yeah. did look up Justin just to look at him online and all the things. I saw that you have a cameo and all of the proceeds go to St. Jude's. That's really they cool. They That's do. really cool. Yes. That is something cool. small that we can do just to give back. Yeah. Yeah. So that. where, where can our followers find you and follow along with your, your journey? Yeah. yeah. So the best place to do that is on social media. So Twitter or Instagram, um, it's at the Justin Ashley. And then my standard Justin Ashley athlete page on Facebook um, or justinashley.com. But um, yeah, you know, we try and do the best we can to keep it entertaining and keep people informed about what we do. And then obviously, Cameo is kind of a really cool way to, to do something small as a way to give back. So social media, website, um, probably the best way to follow along. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and, and chatting with us today. Of course, I appreciate you guys anytime. Keep it up. Um, I'll, I'll definitely be following along and smiling and laughing. So thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate it. Hope well, to see you again soon. Well, it is good to talk to our special friend. Give it up for Mr. Hot Rider, Justin Ashlyn. Woo! 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 All right. <laughs> Thank and you. That is all we have time for today. Thank you guys so much for listening. Catch us on Thursday with the Top 10 Weekly Wrestling Wrap-Up. Find us on all the platforms at Baker Banter. Yeah. Find Derek on Snapchat and Cameo. Like, share, subscribe, leave a positive review. Just say it. She said it. Okay. <laughs> Review. Uh, find our new merch on bakerbanner.com. Check out my Etsy store, JBJ Creative. It's at the link in our bio. And we will talk to you guys on Thursday. Peace. 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 Peace.